Welcome all you multifamily maniacs. I'm Dr. Heath Jones. And I'm Hutch, the Marine Investor. Morning, Marine. How are you doing? Morning, Doc. I'm doing great. Staying safe out of here from this coronavirus. I, I know. It's kind of crazy out there. Well, given uh, the climate of the world right now, I think it's important to address something that uh, people may be going through whenever they're trying to analyze their properties and move forward with uh, acquisitions. So today we'll be asking the question, how do you perform due diligence on a multifamily real estate property? And so for our listeners, if you get a pen and paper right now, I have 10 items, 10 documents that you would need for due diligence. So I'll list them out one through 10. Here we go. Number one, a financial audit where you look through the rent roll, bank statements, tax returns, and typically you get a third party to do this financial audit. Number two is an internal property condition assessment. Number three is a market survey and condition report. Number four is a unit walkthrough, and you want to walk through every unit, but given the state of the world right now, this becomes a little bit more challenging, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Number five is a lease audit and file audit, so a third party is supposed to go through and check all the contracts and make sure they're saying what they say they are saying. Number six is a site survey. Number seven is a property condition assessment, and typically the lender will hire a third party to do this. Number eight is an environmental site assessment. Number nine is the appraisal. And number 10 is a green report where they assess the water and energy conservation of the property. And so the the whole point of due diligence is you want to qualify the properties based on your assumptions. So it's a fact-finding period. And during this time, if the facts don't match the assumptions, then you can either renegotiate the contract, you could walk away, or you can move forward with the new facts, just knowing that they are what they are. So today we have a very, very super exciting guest to talk to us about how his company walks through the due diligence process. Our guest today is the Director of Acquisitions at Four Oaks Capital. He's a native of Columbia, South Carolina, and a graduate of the College of Charleston. He has over 12 years of sales experience and has received numerous awards for his high sales performance. He was also appointed to the President's Advisory Board and Sales Leadership Council. He controls a personal portfolio of single family real estate. Him and his Four Oaks team are truly passionate about multifamily real estate. Four Oaks is committed to bridging the divide between conservative underwriting and high yield returns. You can find out more about our guest and how you can invest with his group at www.fouroakscapital.com. We'd like to welcome Mr. Eric Shirley. How are you doing, sir? Doing great, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us today, Eric. (laughs) We appreciate you joining us to talk about this. I know that uh, due diligence was something that whenever I first started getting into multifamily was a little bit of a landmine field trying to navigate to make sure that I knew everything about the property so I wasn't buying something that I couldn't, biting off more than I could chew, I guess you would say. Absolutely. And this is a very important point that uh, a lot of people out there don't really know all the items that you need uh, because it's not something that you really talk about as much. You have to go out and find the information. So hopefully we can capture that for our audience and deliver it to them. So yeah, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, sharing any knowledge I can and, and helping out the audience any way we can. What is your favorite real estate quote? Yeah. So I, I'm a big subscriber to the Hal Elrod miracle morning kind of mentality. And okay. as part of my, my morning affirmations, there's a quote I love to read and it's by Russell Simmons. Um, and it's, I know some people say to keep, keep your eyes on the prize, but I disagree. When your eyes are stuck on the prize, you're going to keep stumbling and crashing into things. If you really want to get ahead, you've got to keep your eyes focused on the path. Slow down to go fast. It's so important that, you know, we're so focused on the end game. Sometimes we forget how important it is to focus on the little things right in front of us to, to kind of get to where we're going. And I see that a lot too, especially when we, when we speak to speak to investor, right? Um, um, there's a lot of folks that they want to do it themselves, right? And they end up taking years and several years to actually get where they want to go. You know, so, so that they, they're on the path, but you know, not, not, um, not so focused on the end results of I want to own for myself, but um, I'm focused on the path. How do we get there? We can get here together. You know, so I hear that a lot. So this is a great, and, great quote. 
to your point, Hutch, due diligence, I mean, it ties in perfectly with the whole due diligence theme. You know, everyone wants to acquire units, but if you're not going to focus on making sure they're the right units and there's right. no skeletons in the closet, what you think could be, you know, a great opportunity for your investors could, could turn out to be just a catastrophe. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's Having right. 250 doors is awesome unless they're the wrong doors. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. So Eric, why don't you tell our audience a little bit more about yourself? Sure. So uh, I was a collegiate athlete, swam at the College of Charleston, uh, double majored oh. in biology and business administration with all intentions of going to medical school, uh, much like Dr. Jones there. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, when we, I, I got into real estate in college, uh, two buddies of mine, uh, we're flipping houses and it was fascinating to me. And so they kind of introduced me to house flipping and flipped my first house at 21 years old and really never looked back. I uh, got my, my introduction to real estate and got into the single family side, met my wife, got out of real estate right before the 08 crash. So I look like a genius, but uh, <laughs> if, if I'm being honest, it, it had nothing to do with, with my, uh, with my prognostication skills. It was more you know, I met my wife, she got a great working opportunity. So we moved outside of Manhattan for a few years, got out of real estate, got back in in 2013 on the single family buy and hold side, started building a, a residential portfolio. I realized about three years ago that the scalability of that just was not, what was not going to help me to achieve the financial goals I had set for my family and really did a ton of research as to kind of how to achieve those financial goals and started learning more about the multifamily side spent a tremendous amount of time, probably 12 to 18 months on the educational aspects and really learning the game before I became a player in the game. Founded Four Oaks 12 months ago now, and we, we haven't looked back. We're, we're growing as quickly as we can in an educated fashion, uh, buying things the right way. And, and we're really excited about everything that's going on uh, right now in multifamily real estate. Man, you guys are just crushing it, though. Uh, you know, last year we all met at Dealmaker Live, Michael yeah. Blanc's uh, conference that was in Dallas. And uh, you guys were just in the process of getting ready to close on the Spartanburg deal. And so, uh, and since then, you guys have just been knocking down <laughs> deals left and right. It's It's been fun to watch you guys grow. And it's really a testament to you guys as individuals and working as a team, but then also a testament to how it can be done. If you have the education, you team up with the right people, anything's possible. And, uh, you know, it's just been, it's been great. <laughs> well, thanks, Heath. I appreciate that. And I'm so fortunate to have the team members I have, um, you know, collectively and from a synergistic standpoint, it's, it's just been such a blessing. So, uh, yeah. I'm one, one piece of the uh, one piece of the pie. I have three other phenomenal partners, and, and without them, none of this is possible. Yeah, it's, it's yep. absolutely yep. amazing to see how you guys work well together, the synergy in, in the team, right? Um, and you guys have been able to accomplish four deals in the past past twelve months. Yeah, so re really, we closed on our first deal in October, um, and we've we've had three cents. So we we're at uh, just shy of two hundred units over the last six months. And, you know, we have several more in the pipeline that we're excited about. And we just continue to try to do things the right way, underwrite conservatively, find the right opportunities for our investors. Um, you know, we pass on a tremendous amount of, uh, I don't want to call it garbage because there's no such thing as garbage <laughs> out there. But I, there's a lot of people that think very highly of their properties right now. Let's put it that way. They do. Yeah, so, we are experiencing the same thing out in the trenches, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, we've, we've probably underwritten 300 deals in the last three months, and I think we've submitted four LOIs. So, you know, you, you have to sift through a lot, of, a, a lot of stuff to find the diamonds in the rough, but they're out there, and, and we're really excited to, to have continued opportunities. Man, it's also amazing to me how often we've ran into someone willing to not just overpay, but significantly overpay for properties out there that there's just, you know, what our, our, our legal team, Merle Kaliser was like, you know, it's uh, just let them buy it for all that. And then one or two <laughs> years when they can't meet their goals and they have to sell, go and scoop it up for a lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah, so, it, uh, we're, we're primed and ready for a lot of these properties that they're, they're moving forward with someone else's bid because it's, 200, 400 K more than what our top line was. And I don't know how they're going to make it work. And so we'll, we'll have to see how that all plays out in the, the next year or so. 
you know what's funny about that, Heath, is one of two things is going to happen. Either they're going to fail and it's going to create opportunities for those of us like, like you guys and ourselves that are doing things the right way. And we certainly don't want anyone to fail. But if that happens, we'll gladly be there to pick up the pieces. Yeah. And the flip side of that is if they're able to achieve you know, their exit strategy, which is going to put their price per door at a much higher level, the, the properties that we're buying are just going to absolutely knock the cover right. off the ball. So <laughs> either way, it's a win-win I like for folks that like thinking. us. I like that thinking. It's like uh, the stuff we're buying now, once the cap rates compress from all these Yahoo's buying these more expensive, that's just going to be good for the properties Egg. you're acquiring. Exactly. So it's win-win. So in every acquisition of property, there's steps that are very important. As the director of acquisitions, uh, what would you say the goals are when you're performing your due diligence? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, certainly there's, there's certain aspects that the lenders require that we do. And so we want to make sure that we're checking all the boxes and, and, you know, PCA, structural, environmental engineering surveys, things of that nature. Um, But as important as that for us personally, we're really looking for a handful of things. Um, First and foremost is to confirm our assumptions. When we underwrite, we're underwriting off of, off of paper, right? So we're provided with some financial documents, rent rolls, T12s, and and we're making some, some assumptions. And we always try to factor in kind of overcapitalization on our assumptions and be hyper conservative. Um, But we really want to go in and confirm those assumptions while we're on site. Um, kind of the next side of that ties into when we're on site, we want to fine tune and tighten up our CapEx budget. So again, we always try to overcapitalize on our underwriting so that we can really start to trim the fat and figure out where we have opportunities to trim some of those numbers down or or where where we might have underguessed some of our budgeting uh, for maybe roofs. We thought roofs were in a certain condition, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, however you look at it, Sellers are not always as honest and forthcoming as we may like them to be. <laughs> so when you ask, when were the roofs replaced during, you know, your, your conversational due diligence, I, I guess, or, or when you're planning a property tour, and they say, oh, I, th- I think I'm pretty sure. And those are always red flags, I think, or I'm pretty sure. <laughs> pretty sure they were replaced seven or eight years ago. And you get out there and you're like, there is no way on God's green earth those were replaced seven or eight years ago. Those are, those are 20-year-old roofs. So confirming assumptions is super important. We're looking for skeletons in the closet, right? So Mm -hmm. we want to make sure there's nothing glaring that could interfere with our business plan. Um, Nothing that maybe wasn't disclosed or maybe even the seller didn't know about that, um, you know, could prevent us from moving forward or would be major red flags. And to Hutch's point earlier, um, some of those red flags present opportunities for negotiation or retrading. Other ones are red flags enough where, where we, we can walk away from a property altogether, and we've done both. So it presents us opportunities for negotiation. And last but not least, it's really just verifying all everything that we think about the property and make sure that what we've been told about the property is accurate. So we have a full picture um, when we walk in to, to truly understand the shape of the property and, and what we're walking into. Four Hooks focus on acquiring A and B, I mean, B and C class properties, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. So what comes with that? One of some of the things that um, you look, you're looking for is pretty much um, on the manage or right. Uh, and also it, it, the property shows some signs of um, um, deferred maintenance, right. That, that gives you the opportunity Absolutely. to do some value add strategies. Now, how do you, so we look talking about administrative um, due diligence and also physical due diligence of the property, right? right? How do you go about getting these documents to perform your administrative due diligence? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, when we submit an LOI, we actually have an appendix in it's the last page of our LOI that, that lists prior to, you know, even moving forward in the process, everything that we would want to see from the seller. And it is robust. Uh, I mean, we're talking about 30 to 40 different document types that we want to see from wow. the seller. Now, with that said, it can be intimidating to some sellers. So there's been times when we've had to trim that list down on smaller assets uh, especially if they're, you know, mom and pop type assets, you send them over a list and they've been keeping books on the back of a napkin. You know, <laughs> yeah. they look at this and their heart starts paper palpitating. Sack full of, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and, and we've seen that. Um, you know, when you're dealing with larger assets and, and larger management companies that are involved, obviously the bookkeeping is a, in a much more intricate level. Um, but it does two things. One, it gives you the ability to get a tremendous amount of information on the property. So you can look for things like recurring uh, recurring maintenance issues 
that's a huge one that is oftentimes not disclosed. But if you track the maintenance logs and you see that, you know, building B has had roof leaks where they've had to repair uh, sheetrock in the ceiling 10 times in the last 18 months, maybe building B needs, needs to have the roof looked at. <laughs> um, so it's, it's stuff like that. I mean, I think on the flip side of that also, it, it's, it's a, a, a leverage or negotiating point because if you send over all this documentation and the seller's like, oh my gosh, if we're willing to take some of those things out, that's, that's a show of good faith on our part where we can in turn ask for a show of good faith on something else from the seller. Okay. <laughs> so everything in a contract, as you guys know, is a negotiating point. And so to have that really robust list offers us tremendous protection and insights into the property, but it also offers us the ability to negotiate on some other things. So it's a leverage point as well. I have to say with the with this appendix, this is this is a great idea to have because a lot of times you, you may have some language in your LOIs that say you'll need the records, but very specifically setting that up for the seller, as you mentioned, that's that's great. It gives the seller a heads up on what's going to be needed. Um, and so but now that you say, say you get all 30 documents from the seller, how do you go about analyzing those documents? That's the daunting task to sort sure. through 30 documents, cross-reference them. The, the bank statements across the rent rolls, does everything match up? Are they, you know, a lot of people who are selling properties don't report all the income that they may get <laughs> and they don't report all the expenses. So sure. how do you... T- how do you go about cross-referencing the documents you get to confirm your assumptions or find flaws in the facts? Absolutely. And that's such an important part. And to speak to resources, I'd say our, our two biggest resources are probably uh, Starbucks and Monster Energy Drinks. Because, <laughs> uh, you're talking about some serious line by line. I, I mean, it's excruciating at times. And I think that's important for people to understand is this is not like a high level gloss through. But when you get right. these documents, you're going through line by line. And, and it's so important to make sure that that information lines up. And to your point too, you know, we have this robust list of, of things we're looking for from sellers. But one of the things we get the least from the sellers is bank statements. Most sellers are not willing to disclose bank statements. That's right. I don't think it's for anything shady. I, I don't know how comfortable I would feel, you know, disclosing my bank statements. Um, so I, I get where they're coming from. So having to really look at the documents that you're given and try to jump to logical conclusions, that's, that's super important. So we have outsourced. Um, early on in the process, we were involved in everything. And, and a large part of that was an educational standpoint. Outsourcing is great, but if you don't understand what you're outsourcing, you, it's, it's like the old thing when we underwrite properties. The information that we use to underwrite is only as good as the information that we're given, right? So it's information in equals information out. Due diligence is no different. So we wanted to make sure early on in the process that we were heavily involved to understand it and really learn it ourselves. And I think that's important. We use our property management companies. They've been huge resources in things like lease audits, things of that nature. Uh, Here at Four Oaks, we've been fortunate enough as we've grown um, and continued to kind of grow our brand. We just brought on an intern that is going to be working with us. Um, she's going to be doing a lot of data analysis and things of that nature, but she's also helping with processes such as due diligence. And then we are starting to look at outsourcing, uh, to virtual assistants and going down the VA path. A great resource is with virtual assistants. You've got guys like Neil Bawa that swear by the whole virtual assistant (laughs) model. And we have not gone down that path yet, but it's certainly something that we're having regular conversations around of where can we utilize Uh, some folks. And to that point, Heath, I think it's important to really look at what your time is worth. And depending on the structure of your company and how many people are involved, you here at Four Oaks, there's four of us. So that's that's, that's a benefit and it's a detriment. It's a benefit because we have four people so we can split things up and really focus on being experts in our lanes, if that makes sense. The flip side is there's four of us. So we split everything four ways. So from a growth standpoint and a financial, reaping the financial rewards that come with multifamily, you know, it's going to take us longer to get to some of the places that a one or two man shop would be able to do. We do see the value in outsourcing. I do have to say, uh, getting four deals in, in 12 months, uh, that, that growth is coming from the team. And so 
as opposed to one person trying to do it by themselves, they might get one deal over 12 months. So exactly. it, it might, it might balance out as, as you're able to now, and if you're doing it smartly, you're able to acquire more properties uh, as a team. And so even though the, the growth, because everything's now split into force, it's, it goes back to one of my favorite things about multifamily that I heard that really changed my mindset from, well, I just want to own all the doors and do everything myself to thinking about having a team is that giving a small piece of a big pie is a lot better and could sometimes be bigger than owning the entire pie that's smaller than that small piece. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and not just that, that small piece of that pie allows you to now go get more pie quicker. <laughs> Certainly. No, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, it's a, such a cliche teamwork makes the dream work, but there's so much <laughs> truth to it. I, I mean, I, I can tell you that it has allowed us to scale and, and do things the right way. It, so we've got some folks that focus on the today and other folks that can focus on the tomorrow. And so they're building kind of the, the foundational structure for the next 12 and 18 months behind closed doors while some of us can focus on what's in front of us in the here and now. That's been hugely advantageous. I wanted to get back to something you said about how the owners sometimes have trouble giving out their bank statements. And then as a general kind of for our listeners who are uh, wanting to be active investors, would this be something where you would suggest if you're acquiring a property to set up a separate LLC with its own bank account for that property so that in the future you have bank statements that are specific to that property that you're then able to give during the sale of your property? Sure. No, I think that makes a ton of sense. And that's, that's what we've done um, for ourselves. I think some folks, especially when you're acquiring portfolio deals, they'll just kind of lump everything into one bank account. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. we have gone down that exact path. We have separate bank accounts, both checking and savings for every single individual entity that we have. And every property is it's in its own individual entity. You know, so we, so we talk about submitting, submitting a letter of intent and how it's structured to ensure that you can actually get the property. You can start negotiating a purchase and sales agreement, the PSA, right? The contract. Sure. Now, as we all know, there's, there's, there's a monetary contribution that comes with acquiring a property, right? Yes. And, and as we talk about a due diligence, not all, prop, not all contract works out. Now, how does Four Oaks ensure that they're what we, used, we call in, in, this, in this space a um, risk capital, which is all the money you spend for ins inspection, traveling, and also your, your earnest money deposit. How does Four Oaks ensure that risk capital is not so much at risk? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so we always try to do the items that will cost money out of our pocket towards the back end of the due diligence period. Okay. So anything, so if we know that we're going to, you know, we want to walk all the units in that property and we want to do so with the GC while we're out there, we want to have the property inspected, this, that, and the other, any of those things that, that have a monetary value tied to them, we're going to do later in the due diligence process. We're going to do all of the, the paperwork side of due diligence and the lease audits and all that type of stuff on the front end because those cost nothing. And if we determine anything that's a red flag in that, then, you know, we can kind of take a step back and reassess where we go from there to, to try to protect our money. I think also it's very important to know your contract. There's a large pool of lawyers out there, right? And just like anything in life, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, come from a medical background and it's funny it's the old joke is what do you call the guy that there's no difference between the guy that was no top of his class in med school and the guy that was bottom of his class in med school they both have a doctor title <laughs> so you know not all professionals are, are equal and we know some guys that have gotten absolutely torched because of a bad contract that came from their attorney um, wow. the language just didn't protect them the way that that it should have. And so it's really important that you know your attorney, um, you vetted your attorney and you know the contracts that they write to make sure that you're being protected in, in all aspects. That's a good tip. Because uh, most that's, of the time you would just defer to the, the lawyer <laughs> and here yeah. he is sending you a contract. And if you don't have the foresight or, or the, the knowledge to read each line, or if you don't take the time to read each line, you don't know what's in there and you're just totally. signing. Yeah. Huh? Yes. I can um, so give you almost, a great example to so say you oh, get through the due diligence 
process, you, right? You get through due diligence, your earnest money goes hard. Say it's a 1% earnest money deposit on a $10 million asset. So now $100,000 of, of your money is now tied up in this deal and non-refundable, right? And there's a fire at the property. It's not your property yet, but there's not a clause written in there that gives you an exit strategy. So what do you do? <laughs> right, because now, you, now you're going to be buying a property that has fire damage in one of the buildings. Correct. Because, or you walk away and your $100,000 is forfeited. Wow. Unless there's a clause in there that covers you. And, and it's just a little example, but that's, that's reality. You know, stuff happens. And it's really making sure that you have language in your contracts to protect you as well as your investors. But early on, you know, during the due diligence process, your investors are not involved. Uh, unless you're outsourcing, like if you have a KP or, or someone putting up your earnest money and putting up your risk capital for, you know, part of the GP stake, which we, we've seen before. Um, but, you know, we put up all of our own risk capital. And, and so we're very cognizant of, <laughs> of protecting it. You mentioned something that uh, I wanted to dive into a little bit. Yeah, please. When you're setting up your due diligence and uh, you're setting in your LOIs and your, your contracts, you mentioned when the earnest money goes hard, right? Yes. Your earnest money deposit, your EMD goes hard. There are a lot of times, especially when you're starting out, that and I think the brokers want it. I don't think the sellers want it. I think the brokers want it. They want the money to go hard on day one that yes. the contract is signed. And for me, that's a big red flag because I don't want my money to go hard until I've had time to review, at least like you said, the paper stuff that requires no money. How are you guys handling the language for when your money goes hard? And then how quickly do you attack things to make sure you get everything done before that day? Sure. No, that's a phenomenal question. And unfortunately, there's not a black and white answer to that. Um, every deal is specific and unique. It is becoming more and more common in larger, larger assets and tier one markets for earnest. Like you can't even compete if you don't come in hard with, with earnest that's money right. day one. And that's just the reality of the situation. So I think a lot of it ties to your specific team and, and your business plan and your strategy. It also ties into purchase price. Like if I found an opportunity that was just drastically underpriced and the like it through my property tour i didn't see anything glaring on the exterior and, and you know we look for things like foundation cracks and, and brick pads and things like that if we didn't see anything that was absolutely glaring and we knew it was going to take hard money and we were getting getting the asset for just tremendously what we deem to be tremendously under market value that might be something where we would be more open to that concept but if if it's we have not gone, we have not come into a contract with hard earnest money right out of the gate yet. Um, we're not opposed to it, but again, the circumstances would have to warrant that for us. There's so many moving parts to this and I certainly don't want to get too into the weeds, but we've dealt with sale sellers before that have had the con have had contracts on this property once or twice previous and the deals have fallen through and they could have fallen through because there were skeletons in the closet that the previous buyers weren't keen on and, and it scared them away but it just as easily could have fallen through because you had someone that came in was not as, as seasoned made an offer that didn't make sense. Couldn't get the lending terms worked out because the offer didn't make sense. And you know, DSCR didn't cover um, maybe that they thought that they were going to be able to be fully capitalized. And a couple of days before due diligence, they realized that they're not able to, they're way behind on their, on their capital raising <laughs> concept. So just because people backed out doesn't mean it wasn't a good deal. But when people back out, the sellers start getting more and more strict with who they're bringing in as buyers. You know, we've seen situations before where the, the two things that are typically retraded the most come from the structural physical side, typically, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're walking through and you see that all the roofs need to be replaced and you they were, you know, eight years old and they're just not. That might be something that you would come in and retrade. So yeah. it's kind of knowing. So we've had sellers before that have said 15 days due diligence on physical inspections, half your earnest money goes hard, let's say. And then you have 30 days to do your due diligence on all the paper trail stuff because you're typically not going to retrade based off of paper trail, especially if they've done a good job of bookkeeping and they know they have. They know you're not going to find anything in that. So it's really just being flexible, being confident in your business plan and knowing that you that you found the right property that, that you truly believe in and you make your decisions based on that. I feel like that was a long-winded answer to a short question, so I apologize. No, no. I, I think there's a lot of inf uh, good nuggets uh, in what you were just saying. 
And then, so I, w I was going to ask, uh, is there any ever a time where you can get the financial documents prior to the contract? So you have a signed LOI, and then in the LOI, you're like, hey, part of you signing this LOI is to get us the documents before a contract is signed. Is that a strategy that would work or something you could use? And now you buy yourself like an extra seven days yeah. with the, the financials to then do it really quickly. And so that you might have a little bit more flexibility and be a little bit more competitive with reducing your DD period. Sure. And, and that's a great point. We have leveraged a bunch of different strategies and approaches. And again, every property in every situation is unique. Um, one of the reasons we love our, our due diligence list and those documents that we ask for is our due diligence period does not begin per our contract until we've received all of that documentation. Right. So if, yeah. if we have 40 documents that we've requested and they've sent 39, we're scouring through these things like madmen <laughs> to get through them, but we're still waiting on that one document. So our physical due diligence period, that 30 day period has not started until we get that last document. So that's a tremendous uh, ask, uh, or benefit That's to smart. us, the That's buyers. Really smart. That works out well in smaller assets. Traditionally, what we've seen is, is as you get into the larger assets that are being managed by you know some larger third party managers, they have everything ready to go. And the moment you sign, you know PSA, those documents Boom. are in a Dropbox file, and they are <laughs> all there, one hundred percent within twenty minutes of signing PSA. So you know, <laughs> there's times when it's advantageous, uh, other times when it's not as advantageous, but. Uh, it, it's certainly a leveraging tool. We know due diligence period. The due diligence is not as, I mean, I guess it's simple because you know what you need to need to inspect, but sure. it, it take it takes time, right? It does. Um, simple, but not, but not easy. There's a yeah. common term that we use, right? Now, we are in trying times right now. And based on some of the, some of the, the setbacks you have had during due diligence period where you show up and you had to meet with a property manager, um, so on and so forth. What are some of the things that, that, that you see that could go wrong in today's market with the coronavirus and all the good sure. stuff? Do you think you could show up to a property and not have access to it or show up to a property and there's coronavirus there and you know, it's totally... Um, it's not uh, safe for you as the person. Safe. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, what no, it, you think? It's a great question. And we just did due diligence on a property recently that, or, or attempted to do due diligence, should I say, um, <laughs> where we did show up and, and we were turned away. The residents wouldn't let us in. Uh, the company that owned the property was not keen on us walking through and expo as strangers, technically exposing mm -hmm. their tenants to, to unnecessary risk. So it, it is unique times. And we are, we are working diligently with our attorneys on, on language and PSAs. And that's been a learning experience, not only for us, but for, for our, our legal team as well, because no one's ever dealt with this. And how do you phrase, you know, certain states, they're like San Francisco right now, or California, I believe. I saw they pretty much locked down yeah, the entire locked state. Locked down everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in South Carolina, where, where the property that we were trying to do due diligence on is located, basically the tenant's rights that they can refuse us entry, which is fine. And they have that right. And they should certainly execute that if they feel like it's, you know, from a health standpoint, yeah, you got to yeah, take care of your family. Um, but that said, from a due diligence standpoint, if, if we had even been able to do due diligence, the contract doesn't read the percentage amount of units that you can see. So say we go and on a, just for easy math, say it's a hundred unit property and we go to do due diligence and 40 of the tenants won't let us in. Well, have we technically done due diligence at that point? Like right. if we can't get in, like, do I want to risk my earnest money? What is that number that it's enough units that I've gone in? Because we want to go in every unit. That yeah, that's 40% unit that, of the property that you didn't see, right? Yeah. And even if it's one unit, and I know that sounds that sounds trivial, but it, that one unit that you don't go in, if you have a budget for interiors of 5000 a door, and that one unit is just in shambles and it's going to take twelve or 13000 that's a big deal. You know? Yeah. That, that's stealing money from something else that you had budgeted. And not that we don't, you know, we always bump up our, our reserves and bump up our CapEx budgets for, for the unknown, but you really want to, it's important to get in and see as many units as you can. So to your, to your question, there's just a lot of unknowns right now. And we've started inserting, we, we call it a doom and gloom clause, but it basically says if we're not able to get in, th this is what happens. Like we're still serious about the property. We still want to take down the property, but if we can't get in, it puts things on pause. And what does that look like? Um, yeah, I was going to ask, uh, what, what if, if that doom and gloom clause is exercised, what does that look like? 
So the way we have it written now, and it is still a, I mean, we are going back and forth and back Isn't and it? forth. It's an experiment, right? <laughs> it's nuts. And, and the, you know, but it's so important to have the language right, both for the seller and the buyer. You know, we're not, our philosophy is, and I know everyone does things differently, but our philosophy is, you know, when we find a, a, an asset that we want to, that we want to purchase and, and acquire, we're not in the business of retrading unnecessarily trying to pull the price down. When we find something, we submit our, our best price. And once we get it under contract, we have all intentions of taking it down and doing it the right way. You know, we want to build that reputation of being the, the buyers that, that can execute. And so we're not looking to take advantage of situations or anything like that, but we want to make sure that we're covered. You know, on a $10 million asset and you have $100,000 of your personal money at risk, uh, that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty hefty chunk of change. That that's I'm not walk protected. away money. <laughs> exactly, right. And so, you know, it's, it's really being, and fortunately everyone's being, you know, we've, Globally, we're bonding together as a community to try to deal with this on, on all fronts. And we've been fortunate that the sellers that we've been dealing with have been very reasonable. You know, unfortunately, you know, brokers with every aspect of this, if a broker would just put the seller and the buyer in the same room, we could get things done in 10 minutes. But we always have to have an intermediary because they have to earn their paycheck, well, which they do a great job. Man. It is what it is. It's transactional, right? <laughs> um, so yeah. I get that. But yeah, I, I told my lawyer yesterday, I'm like, just put me on the phone with the seller and we can hammer out this language instead of going back and forth and back and forth with an intermediary. Um, but just make sure you're covering your tail. You're doing the right thing for your company and your investors, but make sure you protect yourself. So right now, if anybody who's into real estate or especially the multifamily space, one constant thing that you should be seeing throughout all your feeds, your forums, anything you're monitoring is take this time as an opportunity to really think about your CapEx reserves. How are you guys approaching increasing your reserves and CapEx going from maybe having one month of reserves uh, to be super conservative and now having six months of reserves? How are you guys addressing this? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's still, a, it's still a work in progress. You know, we don't know what we don't know. And you want to make sure you want to make sure that, that you're covered and you want to make sure you have plenty of, of reserves. But to from a syndication standpoint, if you're raising that money, it's changing the landscape of the deal, just like your financing terms would change. It changes right. the landscape of the deal. So it, it's certainly a leverage point. I think a lot of it depends on where your seller is in their strategy. Do they have to sell? Are they coming up on the term on, on their loan. And if they're in a position where they have to sell, that's certainly a negotiating point because they have a, a loan coming due. And if you're a steer, you know, and again, we're not trying to take advantage of a situation, but if we're in a position where we have to really buckle down to accommodate for the, the changes in, in the economy and the changes in the marketplace, they're going to have to do the same. I think that's been where the biggest challenge is, is because it's been such a seller's market for so long now. The sellers are so used to being able to dictate the terms. And they're like, fine, if you don't want it, we'll find someone that does. The <laughs> and, reality and they is, probably can. <laughs> well, not right. I mean, so uh, I guess you're really not right seeing, now. Yeah. Yeah. You're seeing two methods of thought right now. You're seeing people that are underwriting super conservatively that are full steam ahead. And if you find the right asset that, and you have the right business plan and you're, you're factoring in everything you just alluded to, it's business as usual for us, you know? Other folks that are coming in with these much more aggressive business plans, part of me feels bad for them, but if they closed two months ago with super aggressive underwriting, they're in a heap of trouble. It's the nature of the beast. Play with fire and you're going to get burned eventually, you know? <laughs> That's right. Um, so it's so important from a syndication standpoint to do your underwriting conservatively and make sure you're factoring all these things in. From a passive investor standpoint, it's so important to vet your syndicators and your operators right now. Um, make sure that, that they're doing the right things. Make sure that they're aligning their interests with your interests and really making sure on all fronts um, because we have a lot of people with a volatility in the market that are ready to, to deploy capital. We want to make sure we show them that before they deploy capital, we're doing things the right way and we're set up for success to weather out this storm, which we think is a short-term blip on the radar. Right. That's great. That actually leads into sort of the next question I had. Um, Perfect. So <laughs> I love it when that happens. All right. So <laughs> only talking about properties that you've already closed. Sure. Uh, what were, were there any assumptions that you made that had to be adjusted after doing the due diligence process? And what were some of the red flags during your DD period that caused you to walk away from some of the properties you mentioned walking away from earlier? Yeah, I can think of two examples right off the top of my head. Uh, one deal that we had 
we knew that the roof was going to need some love and we had budgeted for that accordingly. And we had worked with the broker carefully throughout it. And you always want to think that the broker has your best interest at heart. I still like to think they do, but we were talking to a broker and he was like, you know, we've dealt with this before this roof. You're looking at probably $40,000. Well, then when we got roofers out during the due diligence process and the, the cheapest roof re- replacement came in at $80,000, wow. we're like, wow, that's a pretty sizable difference. And the, <laughs> the quotes range from 80 to 160. The lowest was 80. Right. So that was some, that was the one time that we've gone back and, and retraded and, and created dialogue, you know, mm-hmm. around that to say, Hey, we know the situation exists. So that's an example where you might want to retrade. So when you say retrade uh, for our audience, what, what exactly do you mean by retrading? Yeah. So retrading is essentially when you go in during the due diligence process and you, you find something that's more than just a five or $10,000 item that you weren't counting on, something that's tens of thousands of dollars. And you would approach the seller and say, listen, you did not disclose this early on in the process. We get out here. This is not just something we're going to have a problem with. This is something that anybody that tries to buy this property is going to find during their due diligence. Right. So either lower the price or we walk, essentially. It can be roofs. It can be plumbing. Oftentimes, it's plumbing and electrical or a major structural issue where you find out, you know, there's foundational. Foundation is a huge one. Like if there's foundational issues, that is a massive red flag. So it's not something that we necessarily walk away from, but it's something we would approach the seller and say, listen, either you fix this on your dime or you reduce the purchase price by the amount and we'll fix it on our dime. But that way we're at least factoring that into the process. We would always right. rather them fix it on their dime because then if there's something more than inevitably a contract is always going to come back and say, and this, and this, <laughs> Oh, by the way. Um, so we would always rather them take it on, but it's just a leverage point to make sure you're, you're covering your tail. But for the audience that, that's not familiar with retrading, retrading is a very frowned upon practice. Brokers hate it, so you're dam- you run the risk of potentially damaging a relationship with a broker, and sellers hate it because now you've tied up their property for X number of days, and you've really put them in between a rock and a hard place of do they stick with you and lower the price, or do they want to take it back to market in a seller's market and try to get that higher price point with the situation as is. So you don't want to retrade unless you absolutely have to, at least in this current market. Thanks for the that tip as well, because, sure. you know... It's definitely the case where a lot of times in any real estate transaction, you find something during your due diligence, you want them to take care of it. Typically in real estate transactions, there's times when you find stuff during your inspection that you might be able to negotiate uh, a lower price or the seller fixing that. But it's good to know that in the multifamily space, if you're doing that, if you do that a lot with the broker you're working with, they may start to not like you because that's not a common thing um, or, or you might upset the seller. So knowing that is pretty helpful, I think, for our audience. Well, and reputation is everything in this industry, both from a capital raising standpoint and, and you know, securing that equity from the private sector, as well as you know, broker relationships and, and even the selling community. You know, we lost out on a deal where we were, we were the bridesmaid. You know, we started off early on and we were the bridesmaid quite a few times and not the bride. Um, but one of the deals we lost, well, one of the deals we lost out on that was a really nice deal. They offered, I think two, it was a $4 million deal. They offered four, two, we were at 4 million. The four, two got the deal. And then they retraded down to like three, seven. And the stuff they retraded for were things we knew about on the front end, but their whole strategy was to come in high, get it locked down under contract and beat the, beat the owner up. It's unfortunate for the owner because he lost out on a few, few thousand dollars we already knew about those issues and we had built them into the underwriting and our deal still worked out well at $4 million. So we lost out on a, on a great opportunity. The owner lost out on a little more cash in his pocket, but I do know that that seller has built a name in this specific market now that is not a favorable one. Great information. I appreciate it, Eric. Um, so what is for, what is the four Oaks team working on these days? Yeah. So we've got some really cool stuff in the pipeline. Uh, we're launching our own podcast here uh, shortly uh, looking to launch in April. We've got some really cool stuff that we've done on our website, uh, on our Facebook page. We have started kind of an educational platform called Ask the Expert. And so we do a weekly video based on questions submitted to us from our Facebook followers. It's a little short segment each week that we can address kind of the questions or concerns coming in from, from an outside audience. And then we offer at Four Oaks, we have a, 
we've kind of built three foundational platforms in our methodology of how we run Four Oaks. And it's, you know, high level of communication with our investors, full transparency with our investors, and education through investing. So while coaching programs and things like that are phenomenal, not everyone has the means to be able to afford that. And if you have thirty or forty thousand dollars and you want to invest in an opportunity to get a return on your investment as a passive investor, we've created kind of a platform where we peel back the curtain and offer up some education to our investors and give them the opportunity to come in and do due diligence with us, uh, so they can get that education while getting a return on their money, so their money's not tied up in educational forum. I appreciate it. So <laughs> as we wrap up this podcast, uh, Eric, we're going to dive into the the focus round. Yeah. So what do you do for fun, Eric? Yeah. So, you know, I, I have two amazing daughters. Uh, my wife is awesome and, and we love the beach. We live at the beach north of Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm an avid surfer. I tra- travel all over the world surfing. I play the That's guitar. Cool. So between spending time with my children and, uh, you know, music, uh, we're huge reggae fans. So we listen to a lot of, uh, a lot of music on the Jamaica. beach. <laughs> yeah, man. So we love our music in our house and uh, love getting in the water and surfing any, any opportunity I get. I did have in another life uh, dreadlocks down to here. And nice. the question I always got was, hey, do you like Bob Marley? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> well, yeah. Do you just assume that because of how I look? And of course they are, you know, but. But anyway, yeah. it's, that's funny. <laughs> that, that's, I would uh, love to be that guy when I get older, the, the, the big gray dreads that surfs yeah, and has a real just, estate empire. That, you know, that's the goal. It, it looks like you have a, uh, a lion's mane. Exactly, know, it was, yeah. It was great, so. That, that is actually <laughs> um, intent. Speaking yeah, of. right? Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Focus O for opportunity. What is one opportunity that was a game changer for you? Yeah, the, the game changer for me came when I was 20 years old. Uh, two of my buddies I, I mentioned and alluded to this earlier in the podcast they had started flipping houses and they ended up dropping out of college to flip houses. And I was fascinated by this. They were so close to graduating. And I was like, why don't you just finish school? They were making so much money flipping houses. And when I would inquire about it, they gave me two books. They gave me Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. They gave me Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. (laughs) And I, I mean, those books literally changed the way I looked at the world and changed my life for the better. Um, so I, I would say that was kind of my, fulcrum and, and tipping point, you know, my Malcolm Gladwell moment, if you will, that, that yeah. changed everything for me. You talk about um, a couple of things that um, Four Oaks is improving. One of, proven. One of the biggest thing is um, communicating with you, with yeah. your investors uh, and also educating, educating them. But well, for, for you, what would you say is one of the most important communication tips? Yeah, I, I wrote down three and I think these are, are really important. And the first is follow up with dates. So anytime you're talking to someone, always have an action item with a date tied to it. So, you know, if we're talking, I say, all right, great. That was a great conversation. Let's follow up on Friday. What time's good for you? And nice. that, that way you always create some accountability and you put a deadline on it. Right. If there's not accountability, things often don't get done. So I think that's super important. Temp check. So this is a sales thing. We call it temperature check. And it's, huh. it's basically throughout your conversations saying things like, does that make sense? You see where I'm coming from? <laughs> And because a lot of times we, especially in the real estate industry, when we're talking to less than seasoned investors, we're throwing out acronyms and LOI, PSA, NOI, cap rate. And they're like, well, is it cap rate? Like what? (laughs) And so doing temperature checks along the way and say, does that make sense? And give them the opportunity to say, because no one wants to be the guy that's like, hold up, I'm not following this. Like, (laughs) like that's embarrassing for a lot of people. They just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you never hear from them again. So doing those regular temperature checks and just make sure they're comfortable and and they're still following along, I think is imperative. And then the last one, and and this is circumstantial certainly, but email. Email is important because there's a paper trail. Conversations are lovely, but if you don't have email, it's a he said, she said. And so, especially when you're dealing with like property managers, having that paper trail of, you know, we're four weeks later, I'm like, hey, how is the signage coming? And they're like, well, we hadn't decided what we were going to do. We were waiting on you. And I'm like, nope. Three weeks ago, here's my sign off with let's get this going. And so it creates that accountability and that paper trail. And then the last thing, and this isn't on my original list, but do what you say you're going to do. If you tell someone you're going to follow up with them, follow up with them. It's amazing to me how many people have these great conversations and just 
don't follow up. Just follow up in general is, is paramount. So obviously getting into real estate, it was a great opportunity for you. But what is one thing you wish you had understood earlier? I don't want to be a one upper here, but I'm going to go with two things here because I think there's two really important things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The first major regret I have is going down the single family path prior to going into multifamily. Uh, I didn't know about multifamily. I, I never thought it was something that was attainable for someone like myself. And, and when I got into the, fit, the single family residential side on the fix and flip, I was actually syndicating and didn't even realize it. You know, we were using private investor money at 20 years old and I, I didn't know what a syndication was. Someone had taught me how to do it and I was doing it. So I wish I'd gotten into multifamily earlier. I would be in a much different financial position today. The second thing, uh, on, and this is applicable to the multifamily front, is the importance of a good lending partner. Term sheets are cheap. And what I mean by that is lenders are just like brokers. Everyone wants your business. And there's a lot of lenders that send out term sheets and are not able to deliver on what the term sheet's reflecting. Okay. And so it's so important to find the right lending partner for your team that when they say that, that they've underwritten the deal and they might not always give you the best terms, but the reason they don't give you the best terms is because that's what they can actually do. And they're able to deliver on that. And we've run into deals before that were the reciprocal where, you know, we went with a lender that promised us this, that, and the other, and two weeks out from closing, things change. You want to talk about sleepless nights. That, that's terrifying. And so really finding a lending partner that you can depend on and don't take a term sheet at face value, you know, really follow up with your lender, stay on top of them, find out, you know, speaking of the coronavirus, my gosh, uh, I talk to my lender three times a day right now because things are that volatile and changing in the lending space between yeah. spreads and, and LIBOR floors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's nuts. So in the instance where you have a lender two weeks before closing tell you they can't do what they said they were going to do, do you have to then exercise an extension in your contract and find another lender? Because isn't the minimum to get a lender to closing like 60 days? Is that, am I yeah. correct? So, so in this case, we did have to use an extension. You're bringing up, you're ripping off band-aids here. Heath. Uh, sorry, um, sorry. I'm opening up old wounds. I try to forget <laughs> about this. Um, but no, essentially, and, and this was not entirely the lender's fault, but we saw the writing on the wall. And instead of them coming to us proactively, we didn't know what we didn't know. And, you know, there's learning experiences, especially when you're early on in, in the game. But finding someone, and in our case, basically our proceeds changed. So we went from having a deal that was fully funded to needing an additional $400,000 to be fully funded seven to 10 days before we closed. And, and just, our rate just a little bit you just needed a little bit more to push it over right yeah it was it was it was uh it was close to half a million <laughs> and we scrambled and we got it done we, we bought the extension we did things the right way and we delivered um but again to your point about emd earlier we would have lost almost two hundred thousand dollars in earnest money wow. um so it put us in a precarious position and the worst part was it could have been avoided with communication and the lender did not communicate the way that we would have hoped. It's really important to find that person that, you know, the lender that we use, uh, they did a three year look back and you know, you can retrade down or you can retrade up. And they found that they were actually able to get over the course of three years, like 72% of the deals that they closed, they were actually able to get better terms prior to closing than what their original term sheet offered. And you would much rather that than the reciprocal Right. You know, where you get caught with your pants down and you're like, oh my God, what do we do? Um, and you put your EMD at risk. So it's just really important to find that lending partner and, and really have trust in them. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's not something typical that you see on the forums where people don't really talk about it. Everybody's like, oh, you need to get a good lender. But there's not a lot of discussion about lenders who don't follow through. So I think that is a key point for our listeners and audience and anybody getting into the multifamily space because you can't do nothing if you can't fund it. And it's if the true. lender can't and if the lender can't close it, then you're you're left losing a considerable amount of money because you didn't realize that that was going to be the case. So Absolutely. I, thank you so much for that 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 piece of information. That's that's great. Definitely. All right, so the final uh, letter in our acronym focus is S for success. To what do you attribute your success? Yeah, I think there's really three things that I can I can say have have led me to the success I've had thus far in, in all aspects of my life. I think the first is is grind. You know, at the end of the day, if I have to put everything on my shoulders and crawl through gravel and glass to get across the finish line, 
we're getting across that damn finish line. Like it's, <laughs> it's going to happen. I feel um, you on that, man. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's doing the things that other people won't, you know, some people, when it gets tough, they, there's two types of people, you know, the tough, the people that run into the fire and the people that run away at four Oaks, our philosophy is, you know, we, we will grind it out. We'll do the hard work to protect our investors because that's really what it's all about. The second thing is teamwork. Teamwork is paramount. And that just doesn't mean like in my case, four Oaks, I have three amazing partners that I, I couldn't ask for better partners, but lending partners, you know, broker partners, the people that are bringing me these deals in, uh, contracting partners, property management partners. This business is all about partnerships in every single facet. Legal partners. Gosh, my lawyer is phenomenal and he goes to bat for us. Uh, when we need something urgently, we have it back quickly. Like he, he's just the best. So finding those good partners and that teamwork is, is imperative to, to success. And the final thing is education. I'm involved in a lot of these forums and, and communities that, that you guys are involved in as well. And the amount of handouts that people want is crazy to me. People just don't want to put in the time and effort to educate themselves. They just want to be told how to do it and go out and make a million bucks and get rich quick. And that's not what this business is. This business is long and it's sleepless nights and it's stressful times. And it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's, you know, you have to build a portfolio and do it the right way and execute. And there's so many facets. So being educated and, and reaching out to people that have come before you and, and paying it forward, there's so many factors to it, but education is such a pivotal part in success. If you're not willing to get the education, don't, don't play the game. I greatly appreciate your knowledge of shopping, Eric. Now, if a li- how, how, can a listener, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Sure. You, you can reach me. Uh, my email address is Eric, E-R-I-C, Shirley, S-H-I-R-L-E-Y, at fouroakscapital.com. Uh, you can reach me on my cell phone, 803-917-6800. Uh, I love talking to people that are passionate about real estate. Uh, people are so generous with their, their time and knowledge with me. I love to be able to pay that forward. Um, you can check out our website, www.fouroakscapital.com or check us out on any of the social media platforms at Four Oaks Capital. Thank you so much for stopping in today and yeah. talking to us through the whole due diligence process. As I mentioned at the beginning of the, the show, it's one of the most important parts of acquiring multifamily properties and one of the things that can be the most daunting and scariest for people getting in or say, you know, passive investors needing to vet a sponsor, like, is your sponsor doing the appropriate due diligence? Well, if you don't know what all is involved, how can you assess whether or not they're doing it properly? So this has just been great. I've I've enjoyed it. I've taken so many notes with all the stuff to (laughs) to include. So I just wanted to thank you again for taking time out today. want you to take care and stay safe over the next few weeks uh, as we, as we as a community is dealing with, uh, this new world we're living in right now. So, well, guys, thank you so much for having me. And, and, you know, I, I've loved being on here, but also loved watching y'all's journey. You know, I've known both you guys for a while and, and it's been a, a privilege and a pleasure to watch your journey. And I look forward to watching your continued success. So thank you so much for having me on. That means a lot. Appreciate awesome. it. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm Dr. Heath Jones. And I'm Hutch, the Marine Investor. <laughs>